Yeah, global connections, you know, uh, update on the war in Ukraine. A couple of thoughts about that. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech. The, the fellow on the other on the other screen is the Carl Ackerman. Uh, he's a, an historian, especially skilled in Eastern Europe. Been on a number of programs with Think Tech to discuss that. But it's a couple of thoughts here. <clears throat> update on the war in Ukraine. You know, there are a lot of threads in the news lately, uh, and some people think that, uh, you know, Ukraine is fading from the public view because there are so many other things that are discomforting uh, happening in the news, especially domestically. But we have to keep on focusing on it because it is the thing that's going to determine uh, the future of the liberal world order, uh, clear enough. That's one thing. So we're going to continue to do this with Carl and others to keep current on Ukraine. And the other thing is because there's so many articles in the newspaper, in the Times and the Post um, about Ukraine, you know, we really have to, uh, you know, collect our thoughts and connect the dots on what's going on. And that's that's the intention here of, um, you know, updating on the war in Ukraine. And let me let me say what I would like to discuss and Carl can agree or disagree. <clears throat> I would like to uh, have Carl catch up and understand how things are evolving in the war including the strange and failing moves of the Russian army, um, of Putin's troubles with the war crimes investigation, and with the oligarchs who are breaking away and protesting, uh, and the Russians uh, who protest by leaving. Putin's move just in the paper today to command the army by himself <clears throat> is very interesting. Um, the surrender of the steel plant, that was very troubling. It was a, a surrender, no matter what words you put on it, by. Uh, by the by Ukrainian government, Zelensky, and the decisions by Finland and Sweden uh, increasing in their in their urgency to join NATO, understandably, NATO's response to that, and to uh, and and to find out what what is happening in terms of the coalition of support in Western Europe, and I find this very interesting. Turkey's attempts to block the effort uh, by Finland and Sweden in NATO. Um, it hardly it hardly suits him, uh, Erdogan. I mean, <clears throat> Biden's forty million dollar package, attempts by Rand Paul and other Republicans to delay the package. It was going to come on. Uh, I'm sure you realize, Carl. Today, efforts by Mitch McConnell to get the package passed. All these things and maybe more about Ukraine. So I'm going to turn the floor over to you, Carl, and see what you can do on helping us understand. Well, let me let me start with uh, Senator Paul in terms of, you know, what he's attempting to do. Um, you know, this is a huge mistake. Um, you know, I, I often end our shows by saying we are all Ukrainians. And, um, you know, what he's trying to do is to block any kind of um, military aid to the Ukraine. And this is as miscalculated and um, wrongheaded as anyone could be, but it doesn't stop this this gentleman from um, doing things that, you know, you may remember his um, questions during the Supreme Court hearings of, for, the, for the most uh, recent nominee. So uh, this is on one hand, you know, it's one of the few areas where most Republicans and Democrats are united. Um, and this this notion, and I think Rand Paul follows a lot uh, in terms of the, you know, the former President Trump, you know, America first and, and not spending um, monies on, um, on any kind of foreign policy, and this is this is greatly mistaken. But um, let me go on from there. In terms of foreign policy, and I think this is the most important point I'll make today, Jay, is that um, the fact that Sweden and Finland are applying for NATO leadership means that Vladimir Putin has already lost this war. Um, his whole attempt was to create buffer zones around Russia and to restore the for the former Soviet Union, and he has just created such fear in two countries that were neutral and fairly, you know, friendly um, towards Russia and never having problems, you know, just, you know, like uh, uh, simple fences separating Finnish territory from Russian territory in cases and, you know, Finns crossing the border to buy vodka a lot. Um, as I remember, you know, when I was there in 1969, you know, days and days and years and years and <laughs> dinosaurs ago. Um, but um, this is a, this is a huge event um, in diplomatic history, and it's, you know, um, a complete turn in world events. So, you know, by, by committing this war, and of course, what's happening with the Russians on the ground is, you know, except for, you know, one southern city, 
um, is that, you know, they're losing the battles and they're losing the battles because I think for two reasons. One is I don't think the Russian military knew um, what they were getting into. And I think they were ill prepared. That's number one. But but number two, what's motivating the Russian troops? I mean, that there are fascists in the Ukraine. Well, any soldier that goes into the Ukraine um, is going to understand pretty quickly that there are not a lot of fascists and there's a huge up upsurge against them. So I think he is in deep trouble, um, um, both on a military front and, as I said, on a political front, he's, he's lost. He's lost big time um, internationally. And, of course, he's periok to most uh, Western leaders. And I don't think you can get something like that back. I don't think you can get your reputation back. Um, uh, there's no way that, um, you know, he may be able to, um, after this war concludes, be able to sell his oil in Western Europe or his natural gas. But uh, I think he's in, he's in, um, he's, he's become someone that people don't want to affiliate with. So, and um, I'll, I'm going to stop there because I've, I've made a couple points already. Hmm, okay. Well, I'll continue with some of my curiosities. Um, <clears throat> I guess we know what it means uh, when the troops don't, don't have any understanding of why they're there and getting killed. Uh, and we probably know what it means when the Russian families at home, which are ordinary people misled by, you know, state TV, um, when they get body bags and notices that their their young sons have been, and I say young because a lot, a lot of the, you know, the military from Russia is very young, when their young sons and to some extent daughters have been killed. Um, for what? You know, this has got to be permeating through. And one of the questions that have occurred uh, to me <clears throat> uh, is that, uh, you know, there, there's no protest permitted. And if you call it a, a war, you know, theoretically go to jail for 15 years and all that. But there's got to be an, un, an you know, an, an underlying protest, an underground protest, if you will. Just as Putin uses the state TV and he clamps down on social media and all that, there's ways for people who disagree with this war in Russia to pass the word. Um, you know, just as technology can uh, can seize on one side of an issue, it can also affect the other side of the issue. That's the world in which we live. Uh, dictators love the technology they can use for propaganda. But <clears throat> there's a growing group of people, you can read about them every day, uh, who are using the technology back against it. And my question to you is, how do we know about this and how is it working? And is it limited to the protest in Russia, or is it expanding worldwide? Well, let me take the last part of your question first. It is expanding worldwide, and especially in you know all the NATO countries, you know there have been massive demonstrations, and um, you know people have been on the streets. So I mean that's that's pretty clear. What's unclear to me is how big the sentiment is now. When the Russians were in Afghanistan, um, again under Putin, um, you know, uh, before they got out, um, what happened was that um, there, be there became a, a, a clandestine operation by um, Russian mothers, and they banded together um, in, in an organization, I'm forgetting the name of this organization, um, to, remove people, to remove Russia from Afghanistan, because too many Russian soldiers uh, were uh, being killed, and also in Chechnya, the same thing happened. And so, you know, I think that your comments were really the, the most astute ones, Jay, in terms of when it becomes apparent to a lot of Russians that, you know, there are lots of body bags coming back, and there are lots of body bags already coming back. Um, but, you know, when it becomes, you know, 100,000 as opposed to 30 or 40,000, I think Vladimir Putin's going to be in deep trouble. Um, I'm not that he isn't already. But one of the things that's propping up his government is even though oil has been shut off in certain areas in Western Europe, where he's selling to abroad in other places, the price of oil has gone up. So as it has in the United States. And so <clears throat> the, the oil economy is, is, is still operable um, in Russia. Um, one avenue has been shut off, but other avenues, you know, whether he's 
selling to China or to India or, you know, um, African states. I'm sure he's doing all of the above. He's still got Nord Stream 1 working. Yeah. At, so at 200 that, million, 200 million uh, euros a day, he gets paid on that from Germany. Right. So that's that's one thing. Now, um, you know, the uh, he is hurting and the economy is hurting. I mean, just yesterday we heard about McDonald's, um, you know, retreating um, from Russia. And, and I have kind of a interesting story about that is when in August of 1991, when the Soviet Union collapsed, you know, um, during uh, Glasnost and Perestroika under Mikhail Gorbachev, McDonald's had come in and, uh, and you know, they were selling, you know, uh, Big Macs were selling like hotcakes, as the expression goes. Um, so, <laughs> basically my metaphors a bit there, but anyway, you get the, the general, general gist of what I'm saying. And so, you know, the fact that these McDonald's are leaving and a lot of um, um, international companies are leaving and stores are being boarded up, um, this is a real sign of um, economic uh, problems in Russia. And yeah. <clears throat> their, you know, their one car that is decent, Lada, uh, is, you know, Renault and um, other companies from the West are, are, are uh, pulling back. And so, you know, without this Western infusion of goods and enterprises, banking, et cetera, you know, things are going to be becoming more and more difficult um, for uh, the average Russian. No, so, he nationalized Renault. Yeah. Today. Yeah. Yeah, and so and so that, that's what I'm talking about. Is that, of course, this puts everything under Russian um, Russian operation. And, and I, as I said, the last two of our shows, you know, you you don't necessarily hear about a Russian car ever. You know, they, when they're partnering with Renault, or Renault, or a Renault, and or a Fiat, you know, they generally produce good cars. But that's because they have good engineers outside of Russia. Um, not that they don't have good engineers, but they just don't have good quality control um, about almost anything in Russia. So. That's why, you know, people are always afraid in Russia in terms of nuclear waste. Well, should of course, be. my my everlasting concern, even though um, there aren't too many places that Russia now has control of Ukrainian nuclear power, are the, the missiles, the aircraft, you know, that are going into Russia. And the most curious thing, Jay, that I really am puzzled about is the notion of no aircraft. Um, you know, during that um, celebration of World War II in Russia in Red Square. That's a strange one. And um, I'm not sure why that took place. There's a theory that, you know, Vladimir Putin needed to use that um, um, one of the aircrafts, which would carry him um, aloft in case there was nuclear war, um, and it didn't want to expose that aircraft. But the other theory is that, you know, that there's some problem uh, with the Russian Air Force. And if that's the case, then all bets are off because the Ukraine could be that's a right. that's a, a theory that does resonate that the, that the Russian Air Force generals said we're not participating. Yeah, I mean, that just is odd. I mean, that's, so you know, a, not... it could be a rebellion by the military. Yeah, yeah I, I, that 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 could be. I, I think that's probably um, an outlier, but you could be right. Um, you know, you, you know, what I was I was talking to someone today about, you know, the, the strange things that are happening in our world today. And um, the Russian invasion of Ukraine is, is is right up there, and the and the big lie which supports it, you know, is really um, 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 quite awful. But you know what we what we talked about, um, Jay, and we've talked about privately and also on the show is, you know, what is uh, Vladimir Putin going to do in that area between Moldova and um, and Ukraine, and what is what is uh, trans, uh, Vladimir trans, Putin? Trans trans yeah. yeah, Transnistria, yeah, Transnistria or Transnistria, or, you know, Kaliningrad, and, you know, it's, it's in those two areas that I worry about also, in, in, in addition to, you know, nuclear reactors being um, uh, somewhat damaged. But if anyone's watching that wants to know about something to read about the current state of Russia, The Last New Yorker has an, uh, a pictorial section with David Remnick. Uh, you know, the editor of the New Yorker leading that with a with a with a page passage. And then following that is a wonderful um, um, uh, article about the hospitellers. I, I think that's the way to pronounce it. And it's all the people who are going in to try to help. You know, normally um, former Ukrainian um, nationals who are living abroad, they're going back and they're they're working in hospitals. And, you know, there's a wonderful story about that traces the, from the beginning of the war, what really happened to 
to people that are in the war and, you know, what happened to, um, you know, to, uh, to the civilians. And, you well, know, that, mean, that brings me to what happens to the um, 600 army uh, that were surrendered. Uh, uh, Zelensky decided it'd be better to surrender them in the steel plant. And he, uh, he ordered them to surrender. And they were taken away in a bunch of Russian buses into Russia or into uh, Russian-held Ukraine. And uh, ostensibly for medical care, but also possibly to retire them from the war in Siberia. Um, and uh, I mean, what do you make of that? I, I guess from a prudence point of view, from a practical point of view, Zelensky was right in surrendering them. It was going nowhere. Um, but what, what implication does it have? What effect does it have? What consequence? Well, you know, I mean, um, it, it's, it, it's interesting. One can see this, you know, on face value, it has to be a loss for the Ukraine. I mean, there was no, there's no ways around it. But if you look at it from a longer term perspective, like the winter war that the Finns fought against the Soviet Union, um, you know, people don't remember this war as the great victory of the Soviet Union over the Finns. They they remember it as the Finns stopping a much larger army, much better equipped, you know, for months at a time. So I think that's the, you know, I mean, you know, even though I, I, I don't often refer to this historical event often because I think there are many, it's a multi-sided event. But I mean, this is like the Alamo. I mean, you know, for Americans... It wasn't the fact that, you know, that the, that the Americans were defeated or the Texans were defeated. Um, it was the heroic stand of the Americans that had gone down in, in, in American folklore. So, you know, I think this, this is the way it's going to be remembered. Is this, yeah. is that this is a heroic stand by a, um, you know, a poorly, um, I shouldn't say poorly, but under-equipped um, uh, military uh, personnel and, and, and things like this. And this this goes to one of your earlier questions, Jay. Is I don't think this is going to fall out of the um, eyes of most Americans because you know it's it's too central to our ethos about democracy and uh, democratic traditions. And I think also you you have uh, you know um, um, a president um, of the Ukraine who is very good about keeping it on the on the front pages. You know you have a you really do have. I mean you know people have compared him to Churchill and. And things like that, and and, and maybe, um, but he is definitely someone who President Zelensky, who is going to keep this um, war uh, forefront and center, and as well it should be, um, because this is really the democratic fight of our times, and the Ukrainians are heroic, and this is not to do as you know people often do is to make everything Ukrainian perfect and lovely and wonderful. We're not saying that. It's just that, and this. In this particular fight, much like World War II, there are good guys and there are bad guys, and you know, I mean, it's 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 a pretty much black and white. Well, I mean, when situation. you when you start talking about war crimes, and clearly there are war crimes and, and atrocities of a major magnitude, weapons of mass destruction, of killing civilians with no good reason at all by the thousands, um, of forcing a population to leave by ten million people, um, this is um, you know this is unprecedented. Even in the in the thirties, this is unprecedented, and I think this is going to stain him and Russia um, for the next few generations. Uh, it is it is a one great big war crime. It redefines sovereignty. It redefines um, propaganda. It redefines uh, you know uh, it redefines the all these breaches that he's done, including war crimes. And I think. You know, there are 5,000 investigators in Ukraine now, probably increasing daily, who are investigating and documenting the war crimes. And they are going to take these cases. They are already taking these cases uh, to international courts and national courts in Europe, not in the U.S. right now, but maybe. Um, the point is that it's very hard to prevent that those prosecutions and those cases and ultimately the outcomes of those cases uh, from getting back to the Russian people and the world. And, and he and Russia will be stained by um, huge amounts of evidence of war crimes uh, in this war. And that, and that he, he cannot escape that. Well, you know, as in this case of this Russian soldier captured and, you know, and um, you know, submitted to Ukrainian justice, um, 
I think that, that you know that that more of this is going to happen, and um, as these people get get uh, convicted, I think what what the message here is that even if you're a Russian soldier, and you're going into a Ukrainian town, you are the aggressor, and so you know it's it's a difficult it's difficult to swallow. Um, you know, any of the Putin lies, you know, about Nazis being in the Ukraine. And once, as I said before, you know, once the the Russian soldiers on the ground and doing things, I mean, there have been places where Russian soldiers have been where they've said, I'm sorry, you know, I didn't know what was going on. And some of those captured have said that, not because they've been forced by the Ukrainian um, soldiers to do something, uh, you know, under torture or something like this, but just because they realized what they were fighting for was was completely wrong, and you know we've we've had this experience with the Vietnam War in the United States, and um, the Russians. Just to repeat a story that I love because it, it deals with uh, a place that I spent many a year at, at Puno when um, when uh, uh, President Medvedev had taken over from Putin and was sitting at dinner um, at the uh, headmaster's house, and someone asked him about advice for Afghanistan. Um, he didn't hesitate, didn't go through his interpreter and said, get out. Um, and, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm not quite clear why leaders across the world have not gotten the message that, you know, when you invade, as the British did in our colonies, when you invade a, uh, an area that's, that, and you're fighting against an indigenous people or a people that are uh, perhaps not indigenous, but people who have been there before you, or and, and basically know the t- know the territory. You know, unless you completely wipe out everybody, this is going to be a war of attrition, and you're going to lose eventually. You're going to have to pull out. Uh, you know, the Russians did it in Afghanistan. They eventually did it in Chechnya. They did it in Georgia, and you know, this is Vladimir Putin's last gasp. And the, you know, I mean, it, you know, I, I don't know what. You know, when he looks in the mirror and he, and he he says to himself, "Oh my God, I've just lost Finland and Sweden," and they're going to join the organization that he thinks is the biggest threat. And um, going back uh, to Russian history into the 19th century, and I mentioned this slightly before, but I'm going to go into it again because I think it's so important. You've always had since Peter the Great people who were great Russian nationalists versus people who looked to the West. Gorbachev looked to the West. Yeltsin during the last part of his reign. Uh, look to the West. And Vladimir Putin is an intense Russian nationalist. And besides that, he, he, he felt, you know, he has this intrinsic notion of um, terrible, um, uh, I would think, uh, um, hurt. You know, this, this, is, this kind of thing is covered in Timothy Snyder's book, yeah. um, uh, Bloodlands. And yeah. uh, it's a it's a cultural point, you know. You have these leaders in Russia, who who like uh, killing, and um, and it seems to be happening over and over again, especially in Western Russia, you know, between Russia and Eastern Europe, wherever Eastern Europe may be at a given point in time, and it's been very bloody over the years. And I, I mean, you can say that Putin is a bad guy, and he is certainly a horrible guy, um, a war criminal, um, but at the same time. Russia has permitted this sort of thing. It's it's in the culture. It's in the culture of this area, according to Timothy Snyder's uh, historical reference on it. But let me ask you one question before we run out of time, because it's going to take a little time to address this question. Okay. You know, war of attrition. I mean, there's a lot of things happening that could give you optimism. You know, Zelensky is good. Um, the the mini protests you see in Russia. And the maxi protests you see in Western Europe, the existence, the continuation of of the, uh, the coalition. Uh, hopefully, the forty billion dollar aid package passes. Um, Finland, Sweden, all that stuff, and the world is taking notice. And you're right. I mean, a lot of it is what gets out in the press. Um, the press is more powerful than the guns, actually. However, there is the wild card. There's Trump. And if I am Putin, I am playing that card. I got to keep this thing going until we see how Trump does. Because if Trump gets back in power, Trump, this is my expectation, Trump will, will cool it for Putin. He'll give Putin, Putin a break. 
uh, and Putin will see that as an, a huge opportunity to continue his Mishigas. Um So what do you think about that? I mean, Trump is trying hard. There isn't a day that goes by that we don't hear about Trump making outrageous statements and sometimes winning outrageous events of some, one kind or another politically. And it, it seems clear that he's going to be a candidate for 2024. Um, there are yard signs out already in a number of states uh, for him in 2024. If he wins and gets back in power, I mean, this country has a lot to worry about. Our civil liberties uh, are at great risk. Our government, our democracy is at great risk. But one thing also that's at great risk is Ukraine, is, is Eastern Europe, is Putin. It would encourage Putin and Trump would give him a pass. What do you think? I, you know, I think, you know, um, well, there are two things. First of all, I think the likelihood if there's an election, um, you know, if Joe Biden faces off against um, Donald Trump again, despite the economy, I don't think that um, that uh, Donald Trump was going to win. You know, I, I, you know, I look at the past elections and, um, you know, if you're an independent, do you vote for uh, Donald Trump? I don't think so. So I don't think that's a, a great possibility. However, let's say let's say um, it was, let's say it happened, but you have to remember there's, there's, that's two years away, that election. Um, and, uh, you know, in two years, uh, the kind of attrition, I mean, if the attrition occurs at the same level that it's happening now, Russia is going to be suffering severe losses. And, um, you know, if, if, you know, um, God forbid, um, uh, uh, Vladimir Putin decides to um, use uh, weapons of mass destruction, then I think game is off. And I think, you know, I'm I'm hoping that he realizes how good the American military is. Uh, because, you know, um, our targets, our military capacity is huge. And we're not going to be fighting um, on the ground. We're going to be fighting in the air. And um, the American military um, is, um, is, is second to none. And um, I just think that it's 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 a losing proposition for for Vladimir Putin. And if he, you know, if he if if he if he um, launches any kind of uh, weapon of mass destruction, I think then um, Biden frees himself up and says, "Okay, that's it," and he goes to his military and says, "Let's let's take out some cities and um, um, near the border, maybe in Russia or something." But um, then it becomes a uh, you know a big. A, a, a bigger war, and I think uh, Biden has been good about that. But I don't think Russia can survive two years of this. Um, I just think that if he's, if I mean uh, that Putin can can survive two years of this, if if he's forced to do so, his economy is going to be in shambles. I don't think the Russian people um, for the next two years are going to be willing to sacrifice their children. And you know, and as you as you mentioned, uh, <laughs> the. Um, the, the guys that are coming into Ukrainian villages are, are 18 or 19 years old. But you began with a question, uh, um, Jay, that I thought was really adroit. And you said, OK, yeah, Vladimir Putin's going to take over now. Well, we remember what happened when Nicholas II, um, you know, those of us who study history, decided to take over the, 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 the reins of the army in 1916 and 1917. You know, I mean, he couldn't get back to his capital. He was deposed. The Bolsheviks took over, and um, he was he shot with his family in Ekaterinburg. So, you know, not a good idea, Vladimir Putin. Not a good idea at all. I mean, you know, unfortunately, you know, these guys, uh, you know, lose their historical um, perspective. And I just, I think, I really do think, Jay, the turning point has, has occurred already um, with, with Sweden and Finland, because that's a major blow. Uh, to uh, the geopolitics of Russia. And I think for us in the West, it's a great thing because I'm sure that the Chinese are looking and the Koreans are looking and saying, uh-oh, you know, the West is becoming united and all because we blundered. So I think it makes things safer for Taiwan. It makes, uh, you know, um, the, the president of North Korea a little bit less, um, you know, um, hostile, even though he's still pursuing, you know, nuclear weapons. Um, so I think all of this is, I think there, there are good signs, but as I said, in, in sort of um, concluding that New Yorker article, um, or I should say two articles in the, in, in the past New Yorker, uh, were really quite fine. And um, the fact that 
Ukrainians from abroad are still coming back to their country and defending it. And people, especially the men of the country, are saying, we're not leaving, um, is really a profound comment about the patriotism and about the spirit of democracy um, in the Ukraine. And let me, let me leave you with this, Jay, is that um, I was uh, at, you know, this, um, that was a, it was a Zoom, Zoom, uh, a Zoom discussion today by the American Jewish uh, University. And there was a discussion of Bob Dylan and uh, the sacredness of Bob Dylan's words. Um, they were comparing Bob Dylan's songs to prayers. And I think blowing in the wind um, uh, is important for today and the Ukraine. And, you know, when Bill wants the, you know, the cannonball to stop firing, and he wants people in the last dance of that song to stop dying, for God's sake, uh, much less, of course, to his comments about, you know, integration and civil rights. But, you know, I, I think we should all be, you know, thinking about blowing in the wind and applying it to um, the Ukraine and applying it to the Russians in the Ukraine, because the Ukrainians are not doing anything to the Russians. It's, it's, a, it's purely a Vladimir Putin war. Mm, an invasion. Well, I have two uh, remarks to make. Thank you for that. Um, number one uh, is today's a big day because uh, somehow the the vote in the Senate on the forty billion dollar a forty billion dollar package is uh, it's another turning point and um, it, it has huge Im impact not only in in terms of the weapons and support and the aid in general um, but because uh, it gives Vladimir Putin a handle on what is happening politically uh, in this country with a politicized Senate which helped him before. Um, the other thing, I, I think it's always important to say this, and I would say it in response to your comments and, and our discussion in general, Carl, is while we are doing this, we meaning the planet, uh, global warming um, is increasing and not being handled. Um, COVID, for that matter, is increasing and not being handled from a collaborative, you know, organized point of view. And I think when, when you get into this kind of contention, perhaps the greatest crime of all is that as Putin has distracted us from the business of saving the planet and humanity, that's the greatest crime of all. And I would leave you with those thoughts. Carl Ackerman, uh, professor of history, teacher of history, um, especially in uh, the Eastern European area. Thank you so much for joining us, Carl. And there'll be more news. We'll do this again. Thank you so much. Jay, it's always a pleasure. And, you know, you were the king of Mensch. So, you know, uh, for <laughs> those of uh, uh, the audience that don't understand that, it just means Jay's a really good person. That's <laughs> you too, Carl. Thanks. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.